often, as, as you may know, art, art historians will do things uh, like, like read formal papers. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and we stand here and you know, we, we have this and, and I look up about every two minutes and, and when I look up you'll all be asleep. And so so I, I, I thought rather than, than doing some, some formal art history um, and you know, d really do, do you guys like need to leave because the building's burning down or anything? <laughs> um, rather than doing some formal art history, I, I thought we'd, we'd just kind of kind of talk through a process of, of art history. And, and we, we have like all, all kinds of, of, of things we, we, we talk about, as, as you know. And, and can I just ask you, like, how, how many of you have you had a contemporary art history class so far? One of you? OK, well, that's great. Two of you. All right, you, got, you guys are, are, are good. Everybody else, it's like, you know, sign up. Um, it, it, it'll, it'll be good. So what, what I, th I thought we would do is you'll hear all sorts of, of, of basic precepts of, of, of how this, this, this field works. Usually you have to have some kind of, of, of words in German to start out with, um, but, but, I, but I thought an even better thing would, would be some, some words in Latin. Uh, and, and, and yes? <laughs> And, and, and so the, the words are nihilo ex nihili. And, and, if, and if we turn that into, a, into a, a, a good Latin sentence, um, it would probably be something like nihilo ex nihili sunt or nihilo ex nihili fit. But, but really, if you've ever seen on, on, on old YouTube a 70s um, pop singer, Name, named Billy Preston, uh, the, 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 the answer is nothing from nothing. And that's actually the point. It's nothing from nothing. It, it, it comes from Empedocles. And th so that's my like, like formal art history stuff. Uh, nothing comes from nothing. And, and the idea of nothing comes from nothing uh, is, is that you're not a tabula rasa as a designer or an artist or, or or a maker of, uh, of any sort, but, but everything that is about your experience and everything that's about the experience of, of the past visual world, you know, like back to when hominids began, is part of building on the design and the art that you do today. So I thought what I'd do, and, 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 and we'll see how, the, how this goes, um, is to look at two artists. Um, and the, the relatively recent artists, and maybe you know them, and, and maybe you, you don't too much. Uh, but to look at, at, at two artists and how they actually dialogue with past art, thing you're going to hear just a whole, whole bunch, or you might, might say reference uh, pa past art, or you might just say plain rip it off too, but, but that's not really what we're talking about. So this is um, Josephine Maxepper. She, uh, she's a German artist, uh, as, uh, as you can see, and I'll grab my, my pointer here, um, you, you can see, and, and she lives in, in New York uh, and uh, Germany and about three other places, like, like most contemporary artists, are, are remarkably global. Uh, and so although her, her primary living and practice is in, is in New York, she has very much a, a global practice. This is a, uh, again, it's a C print. It's, it's a, you know, kind of mid-size uh, C print, uh, but but the thing that I that I that I'm really interested in. So here's the title, um, C D U C S U, and it, it dates 2001. Um, when you look at it, there's a whole bunch of information that you just know, right? And it's and it and it's and and, and you don't probably know why you know it. Um, but but there, there, were, there were a number of, of German art historians in the beginning of the 20th century who tried to make sense of this. And, and, and one was a guy named Erwin Panofsky, and, and like a whole generation uh, of, of, of Jewish scholars and, and artists, he moved to the United States to, to escape the Nazis. And he had this idea of, of, of what he called primary, secondary, and, and tertiary analysis, and you know that word, uh, analysis is the Greek, to take apart. 
And he believed that we could take apart a work of art and if we did, we would find that we could almost use a scientific ki kind of method to get at uh, an interpretive answer. And it went something like, like, like this. On, on, on the, uh, the, the primary or what he called pre-iconological analysis, uh, there's, there's a couple of women there. Uh, duh, right? Um, and, 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 and we could come up with some other things. But the things that, that, that you know about the work are like, who are these women? And we could spend a, a, a little time kind of thinking, well, let's see. Um, they, uh, they're blondes. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's pre-iconological analysis. Um, well, let's see. They're blondes and they have white skin. Pre-iconological analysis. They're blondes, they have white skin, uh, and they're tall and skinny pre-iconological analysis, uh, and, 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 and then, you know, so Panofsky believed that every, everything that, that, that we do, you know, we just sort of bring this information in, and, in, and, and, and you know, no matter who you are, even species-specific, right? Species-specific, when I look at your face, there's a split representation, and, and we know that, right? We know that as a species, from when we came out of trees, we could see the thing that's back there isn't going to eat us when it gets up, up, up here. So there's things that are built in on, on really a hominid level, and then things that come from our culture that's specific to our culture, or things that come from broader cultures. Um, another guy named Levy Bruhl made a distinction about that. And he said that there, there are ideas that, that we kind of all have, right? Um, and, you know, we, we, we all know that there's the mommy and a daddy and we got there somehow. We all live together in groups and, 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 and he called those, the, those ideas elemental gedanken, elementary ideas. But then there were ideas that, that again, when you look at this thing, you see that, that you know, there, there, there's some tags that we look at and you go, know, wow, doesn't look like, you know, I don't know, it doesn't look like they're having any trouble buying their furniture, I guess. Um, and, 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 and so we would have some information that comes from our, our specific culture. And he called those things folk the, the, the ideas that relate to culture, the, you know, the big I idea of culture, that, and then the ideas that relate to our individual cultures. Does that make any sense? Let me just demonstrate why, why, why it probably does. When you look at these, the, the, these two women, you know they're women, right? Cu couple of, uh, of, 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 of tall babes, and, and we just know that, right? But if we think about this a little bit more, you already know that this is a very affluent apartment, right? And you have, those are your cultural, this is the folk of Gedanken. Those are the cultural ideas that tell you, wow, you know, that is, that is something that if I look at that, well, you got the fireplace, we got the, the furs, uh, we got some fancy stuff. These people have some bucks, right? And so culturally, we know by look, looking at these two women, they have some bucks. Uh, we look in the background, maybe there's somebody that, that works there. Uh, they've got some fancy furniture o o over here. And, and so we, 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 we have that built in from our culture that we know just by looking at this photograph, these are wealthy women. Now we can, we can go a, a step beyond that. What, Panofsky called secondary or iconological analysis. We can go a step beyond that and, and, and we might be able to figure out, well now, where in our culture might we be able to kind of think of tall, way skinny, blonde women that have all kinds of good clothes and are rich? Well, you know, you can fill that in however you want, but I mean, one of those answers is a runway model, right? Uh, and, and so, you know, we, we, can, we can do that. And we can begin to, to say that if we look at this room, wow, these, these women are, are wealthy. Uh, the, these, the, you know, these women uh, have a particular look, and, 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 and we can do that. But what I want to do is, is, is what Panofsky called tertiary or iconological analysis. Because he said the, that what, what we can do is after we have all of that information, we can interpret what the thing is about. In fact, iconology means to icon, you know that word, image, the study of images in a kind of scientific way. So it goes something like this. 
Um, let me just go on. So you got that, right? It's, they're, they're, they're pretty. But when we begin to look at individual elements, right, we go back, back here and uh, too many. You know, there's this really fancy chair and there's this really fancy chair and this really fancy chair. And, and, and we just spend a little bit of time looking at it. A, a lot of things just seem, well, that's strangely set up. And these are tags. So part of how we would be able to interpret the work is when we look at that chair, we could find out by looking at other chairs or design class or wherever you would, you would find it. We'd find out that that chair is actually a Barcelona chair. It was designed by, by Mies van der Rohe uh, and Lily Reich um, in, in, in 1929. It was created specifically for an international exhibition. Uh, it went into, into existence with that exhibition that was held in, in Barcelona, and hence it gets the name the Barcelona Chair until today, because it has never gone out of production. I mean, Mies van der Rohe you know, didn't make, I mean, this is the original design. But the design for the chair has, has never gone out of production. You can buy one today. I looked it up. Uh, call up, I don't know if you do things in class on your computer. <laughs> call up Knoll Designs. You can buy one today, 9,700 bucks. Now, think of that just for a minute, though, of, of what the photographer is telling you about, about her piece. If you buy a knockoff, right, if you buy the reproduction uh, of the Barcelona chair, it's 9,700 bucks. Now, you know, that's kind of a chunk of change for one chair, for one room. If you buy the real thing, right, the one that Mies van der Rohe designed or the ones that were in production back in the 30s, you're talking like tens of thousands of dollars for one chair. So that's part of how we know that, you know, this, 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 this room has this, this kind of unbelievable opulence. Right? And, 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 and we can continue with, with looking at, at this opulence. And Barcelona Daybed, same guy, same time, uh, created you know, this, this sort of interior place. Look it up, it's going to cost you some bucks. So again, it's a tag to let us know the kind of affluence of this place, the kind of opulence of, uh, of this place. And we can look at the other side. So if I went back to the other chair, this thing is called, um, some, it's called Directoire, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it was after Napoleon, in, in, in essence. Maybe some of the, you know that from design history. Um, it's called Empire Style, and in the middle of the 19, excuse me, 1850s, there was like a, a, a redoing of this style, a renaissance of, of Directoire. Same deal, you can buy one today, for tens of thousands of dollars, you can buy one today that's a reproduction for thousands of dollars. And that's just to give you an idea where it comes from with, with Napoleon, he's over here. But he's got this really cool chair. And this is the, the kind of thing that you can buy today. You, I, you can get this on Etsy today, by the way, again, if you want to look it up, you can, you can do that. Um, and, and, and it became a real fashion. And it became a fashion for women in, in the end of the 18th century and in, in the beginning of the 19th century to have these really, really fancy salons, these really fancy in, in interiors. And, and, and this, this woman, Madame uh, Verin, Verinach, um, is, is just sh showing that. And, and she's showing really two things. One is she is a revolutionary woman, meaning the French Revolution. So she's dressed like, uh, like a Greek kind of goddess thing, and she's got this silly do. And, but she's got the fancy chair that comes from the, the first, uh, the first um, council, Napoleon. So then if we, if we begin to, to, to look at other works of art, and this is the other, the other part of, of Panofskian <laughs> analysis, in, in, in the secondary kind of analysis, we could use art, we could use literature, we could use those things from our culture that would give us some kind of, of information to interpret the work. 
Um, and so, you know, there it is, direct wire chair, and this is the first thing uh, here. But again, you know, and, and so there are other things going on in this. And one of those things is, what is she doing, right? And, and you know, I don't know if I have a full one next. I don't. Let's, oh, I killed the entire thing. Um, you know, we, we have built in, right? We have built in, when, when we see that woman, that, that, that she's a maid. And, and it, but we have built in, not from like people who, who are actually domestics, not from people who actually work for a living. We, we have built in that, you know, like from Halloween costumes uh, or for watching porno, you know. Uh, and, 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 and so she's like that upstairs maid that has like the, you know, the fancy uh, hose and stuff. And, and, and she's got that little thing. So, in, in fact, when you look at her, her top, right, the costume is telling you that. You know, if you're working for a living, like, you know, cleaning people's house, you don't really have uh, a, a, a little shoulder open uh, kind of dress. So, so, so again, the artist, Josephine McSepper, is setting this up, setting this situation up so that you know the tags uh, to, to understand it. Uh, but so who is she, right? And, and, and what's she doing? And if, and if you spend just a moment looking at this thing, you'll notice that you're not looking really into a wall, but you're looking into a mirror. And so, you know, when, when you look at, at the Barcelona chair, there's the mirror. So th the maid, right, she's standing right here. So the maid is kind of out here, and, and she's part of our space, uh, and you know, we might think of where, where the viewer is in, in, in that regard in a moment. But this thing nihilo ex nihili, Nothing comes from nothing, according to Billy Preston, or nothing comes from nothing on the serious level from Empedocles. Nothing comes from nothing as you make art. McSepper doesn't sort of invent this. She knows exactly where her work is coming from, and as she designs it, she knows where her work is coming from. The photograph, of course, is completely constructed. Every element of that photograph has been put together. It's not a snapshot. They say, oh, wow, there's really rich girls, and we're going to take a photo of them. No. Uh, in fact, it's really rich girls that we might begin to question what the narrative of the two women are. One's reclining, right? And she looks kind of pissed off, yeah? And one is getting up from a bed, and she, too, doesn't look too happy. And so we might then invent a narrative, you know, who are these, the, the, these women? Are, 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 are they lesbian lovers? Um, are they sisters? Are they two women who have been posed and they got in a really big fight? Do they live together? Is the, the maid who they really do it with? I mean, we can invent any kind of story, right? We can invent any kind of story we want because there is so much information there that, that you know, really suggests something. But the work is telling you what, what it suggests. And, and, and when you look at her just like really closely, you notice that her eyes are giving you this information that's going up to her. So, I mean, you know, she is really kind of looking at that other woman. Um, and you can read into that whatever you want. And, and, and she's kind of like out of the scene, right? She's kind of like out of the scene. She, she, she's getting up, perhaps. So, you know, it's back to this question. And it's back to this question of how we interpret the work why would there be these babe runway models who maybe are sleeping together, who live in this room, and if they've got a maid that apparently the, you know, the maid is really the upstairs maid that they have sex with? I don't know. So how do we answer that? And, and you know, it's like that, that whole rug thing with uh, the, you know, naked baby on the fur or babe on the, or whatever. Uh, but again, McSepper doesn't create a work that comes from nothing. She creates a work that she knows the history of art that has built up to that work that she has constructed uh, a, a few years ago. And one of the places that if we began then to, to look at other works of art that, that we would see that happening is here with, with Titian's Sacred and Profane Love. Now this is an interesting story because when, when, when you just spend a moment, look at how the two women are positioned, right? She's over here, she's over here, she's, I mean, they are, essentially being 
constructed, as it were, uh, in the composition that this woman, who is actually, by the way, she's the sacred love, uh, because it's a platonic notion. Uh, and so the profane love is the one that's covered, and, and the sacred love is the one that's uncovered. But the whole thing was, was made to celebrate a marriage. So underlying the story of, of, of Titian's painting, there is a kind of, of notion of, well, the thing you do when you get married. Though, but we can't talk about that, perhaps. So, is, so, so there's an underlying sexual read uh, of, of what's taking place here. But notice how her eyes, right, are somehow fixated on the other woman in exactly the way that this woman's eyes are fixated on this other woman. And she's peering out, and she is... So, so McSepper realizes how this works in her composition that she's taking from enormous references to past art. But Titian himself also did the same thing. And, and maybe you can, can already fill in the, the, the most, most likely uh, place that, that she takes this reference, which is Titian's Venus Durbino, um, 1538. Now, now, notice the same thing, right? There, there, there are a number of similarities. Ne nothing comes from nothing. There's a reclining nude, a reclining woman. Uh, there's a white bed, a white day bed. Uh, there's a maid in the background. Wow, there's a maid in the background. Now, just to kind of fill in a little story of, of, of this work, it's, it, it's, it's really interesting because we've got Venus here. So she can be nude um, because she's like goddess, right? But it's actually not an image of Venus. This is even weirder because, as you see here, it was to celebrate a marriage, too, from the Duke of Urbino to Giulia Verano. But the model, the body you're looking at, again, is constructed, is actually the body of the Duke of Urbino's lover. Wow. So who's a courtesan, right? What, you know, way fancy word for prostitute. But they were way fancy prostitutes. So Titian, Venus Durbino, is clearly at the basis of how this composition works, particularly when we look in the background and see this maid. Because the maid is, is standing here. She, she's got, and you can sort of see it, she's got like a bunch of, of cloth, right? And there's this woman wearing white. And even in our culture, right, back to Fulke Gedanken, even in our culture, often brides wear white. So the painting was commissioned about a wedding. And the thing that's here is called a cassone. The cassone is, is a wedding chest. Um, and, and, and so it was like all the good stuff that, that the bride took to her dowry, including uh, the really fancy clothes that, that she would wear. In the Renaissance, it was, it was not uncommon for, for one dress of the aristocracy to be like the equivalent of five years' salary of the rest of us. So, you know, we talked about polarity of wealth. There was way polarity of wealth. And so the cassoni then is a wedding chest, and the woman here is a maid. This little thing is a doggy for fidelity, just so we know that you know, it's all good. But Titian himself was referring to past art. Uh, and so this is uh, Titian's Venus Durbino. He, in turn, takes this pose directly from Giorgione, another Venetian artist, uh, and it's a sleeping Venus. Yeah, I've never been able to figure out what they're doing with their little paws here, but uh, it's an interesting thing. So Giorgione is a source for Titian. Titian, in turn, a source for a number of artists, and Maxepper, I would argue, directly, but especially to the update of Titian's Venus Durbino. Uh, by the 19th century artist uh, Edward Manet. Uh, his Olympia updates all of the elements of the marriage and the fidelity to something else. And the something else is this is a known model. She was an artist uh, herself, but a primary model for Manet named Victorine Morin. Um, she has now uh, a, a black maid who's bringing her some flowers and a black cat. 
and a black cat in the 19th century and, 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 and maintained uh, <laughs> later was a symbol of licentiousness. So there, there, there are a number of things that, that we know about, about this work that Manet has updated. One of those is this. She's wearing a choker. Let's see. It's a choker in, in, in 1860s Paris was a symbol of a prostitute. Um, she's wearing shoes to bed. <laughs> And she's staring straight out at you. So all these things, uh, Manet has updated the Venus d'Urbino to be a contemporary woman, but a contemporary woman who is probably a prostitute and looking at directly at you. Again, McSepper knows this. And what he had done, Manet, was literally, with no reservation, to copy the Venus d'Urbino. So nihilo ex nihili. Um, in short, then, McSepper's work relates to this update of Titian by Edward Manet. But that's not really the point of the work. And so the point of the work, then, has to have a little bit of, of, of insider information. And it revolves around that part there, which is actually the title of the work, CDU, CSU which means the Christian Democratic Union and the Christian Socialist Union, which are political parties in Germany, remembering that McSepper is a German artist. Um, and so the only way that you know this by not being an insider uh, is this tag right here. The women are essentially identical. You know, they're Essentially, runway models look the same. They're blonde, they're tall, they're babes. But their real difference is one is wearing a necklace that says CDU, one is wearing a necklace that says CSU, and that's their only real difference. And they live in a kind of opulence that's made up, and made up in this case even based on a whole history of art that goes back to the 15th century. But the part that you probably don't know is that the CDU is actually the party of this woman, Angela Merkel, um, the, 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 the chancellor of Germany, arguably the most powerful, important woman on the planet. Uh, and here you see her running uh, for, for, um, for for Chancellor, with Starkes Deutschland, uh, Chancen for alles, be strong, Germany, will give chances for everyone. The CDU is essentially the center-right party in Germany. Um, you could read that, the Republicans. The CSU, but oh, wait a minute, she changed parties. She didn't change parties. But you notice here, CDU, CSU, uh, where she is still campaigning, the CSU is actually a splinter, a smaller party, primarily localized in Bavaria and way farther to the right of the CDU, but they only can be elected according to coalition government. So in short, the CDU and the CSU come together as one party, even though one party is way right wing and one party is sort of middle right wing, and they become the actual equivalent of the Republicans and the Tea Party. Uh, and so what the work then is about, according to Panofskyan analysis, is not just these two women that look pretty and live in a wealthy place. It's actually a political commentary about recent politics in Germany. Um, just really briefly, and I'm, I'm going to go into something else. McSepper uh, did, did this recent uh, in installation that, that shows how she responds to, to, um, to commercial product, which is her primary thing. Um, and her work is about the place of commerce, the design of commerce, and how we interact with commerce. Um, and so just to give one example, and again, those of you had contemporary art, uh, the, the ready-mades are a direct reference 
again, nihilo ex nihilo, direct reference uh, to Marcel Duchamp. Um, Duchamp had, had made a number of ready-mades uh, like this one, and uh, obviously a work that you know, the, the, the Mona Lisa. I, I have no idea why, why I, uh, have you seen it? Go, you know, it, it, when, when you get a chance, go, go see it, and, and you know, and, 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 and just let me know someday, what's the big deal? You know, it's, it's little and oh, whatever, um, but it's, it's like an enormous big deal, right? And it's part of our culture that it's in, in you know, as, a, as Western people involved with, with, with ideas, it's, it's, it's built into our culture as being absolutely, not, you know, remarkably important. Well, <coughs> Duchamp comes along in, in, in 1919 and, and, and says, well, wha, why is it so important? And again, nihilo ex nihili, referring to the Mona Lisa, he paints, you know, actually he takes his pencil out, uh, with a poster uh, of, uh, of, of Mona Lisa, gives her a little mustache, and writes these really strange letters, L-H-O-O-Q, uh, below it. Uh, but the L-H-O-O-Q is an interesting thing, because what has actually happened then is he's shifted the sex, right, of Mona Lisa. Uh, so she has been unsexed or, or transgendered, perhaps, uh, as she has the, 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 the mustache. So the most beautiful woman in the world becomes this woman with the little goatee. Uh, but then the L-H-O-O-Q is, is sort of cryptic to, to English speakers. But if we would slop it together, it can create a French sentence that goes, à la chaudoku or she has a hot ass. Um, <laughs> but Duchamp, in turn, had himself uh, been preceded uh, by, by this guy, Bataille, uh, who has uh, Mona Lisa smoking uh, a, a pipe all the way back to 1887. Uh, but if we update this whole thing, and we just happened to be walking down the street as Angela Merkel uh, was running for, uh, for chancellor, you might have found uh, that street artists have done exactly the same thing. Um, now, what I really wanted to talk about, though, was one piece uh, that's, that's a video piece by an artist named <laughs> Christian Marclay. He's an American artist. He lived in Switzerland. Uh, he lives a, a, a kind of, again, all over. Um, and I think this piece has, has an incredible resonance to us in, in general, but it also demonstrates this point of, of nothing comes from nothing. So it's a video, it's, it's a 14 minute video, and so I'm gonna show you some stills from the video as we go through. Um, but it begins with, with this thing, right? And, and, and this thing you need to know, um, it's, it's a Fender Stratocaster, uh, and, 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 and a Stratocaster is, well, a Stratocaster is like at the heart of our pop cultural experience, and I can demonstrate that a lot, but it's, it's like, why would someone destroy a Fender Stratocaster? Because as you might know, these things cost about two grand, and you know, it's like, wow, why would you do that? So that's the point of interpretation uh, that, that's going to happen here. But I just wanted to let you know a little bit about a Fender Strat. It was designed by, by Leo Fender uh, and Freddy Taveres in, in 1954. It was, it was an early, it was an early solid body electric guitar. The, the, the solid body electric guitar that preceded it was called a Telecaster. Um, but this is, this is the, the factory. Now the interesting thing here is that Fender, the guy, not the company for the guitar, was was actually an engineer. So rather than Les Paul, who was a guitar player, or some other guitar player playing, it was a guy who was an engineer. Now that tells us, again, nothing coming from nothing. Uh, and it didn't, because it was designed in the middle of the 1950s, 10 minutes long, perfect. And you notice this sort of curvilinear, it's kind of girl curves, right? It's you know, this kind of, kind of curvilinear thing, but that curvilinear thing relates directly to mid-century modern, modern um, design from, from the 1950s, you know, and, and we, we have all kinds of, of, of different names for it. Uh, and, and, and so one example I just brought in and, and sort of notice how that curve, so it, it's exactly of its time, right? It's not, the Stratocaster is not referring to anything in the past. It's exactly of, of its time. 
And that table I, is just an example. Uh, this is by Adrian Persol. It's called the 1465T table because it was just the catalog number uh, of, of Persol um, and, and that couch. Um, gives you some idea. It was called Cu Custom Craft was, was the name of the company. But it looks kind of like that, right? So directly something from the 1950s. Well, maybe the best known thing of, of the Fender Strat in the 1950s uh, was this band uh, that came from Lubbock, Texas. Um, Buddy Holly and the Crickets. This is an old television show called Ed Sullivan. They played on, on, on Ed Sullivan's show. Uh, and, 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 and you might know the, the, the kind of cool connection here. The cool connection is the crickets. It was originally called Buddy Holly and his crickets, but they changed it so the, the crickets got like some billing, right? And there was a band who was playing in, in, in the northern part of England, uh, and they, 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 they were so interested in this band from Texas that they named their band in honor of it, and I hope you can fill in that it's where the Beatles comes from. But back to this thing, right? It looks like, like, like design from, from the mid-century. It also looks like a surfboard. You know, it's got the kind, kind of curvy stuff. And, 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 and surf movies kind of begin in 1959 with, with uh, Sandra Dee as, as, as Gidget. And you know, it's like she wants to be a surfer girl. Uh, and, but then you know, they, they spawn this enormous kind of, of uh, of uh, cultural stuff of, of beach parties uh, and, and you know beach parties of uh, beach movies the maybe most famous uh, this one because it's the first Frankie Avalon and Annette Funicello movie but the real deal is it was a Fender Stratocaster that was supplying the music for these kind of movies and there was one band in particular that was the primary beach band uh, called the Beach Boys, and the Beach Boys are so linked to Fender Stratocasters that they even became sponsored by, by, by Fender, and you see them here now with, with uh, a bass and, 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 and a Stratocaster. Okay, so the video of Christian Marclay is about a Fender Stratocaster, and it, it begins with um, so you have to kind of imagine a little bit since we're just looking at stills. It begins with, with a person's hand tying a rope a around the neck of this $2,000 guitar, uh, turning on an amplifier in the back of a pickup truck which has the, uh, the cord that goes to the, the, the guitar, and then driving with the guitar following it while it's amplifying the sounds uh, of, of the guitar hitting the ground, and you can sort of imagine uh, how that works too with the electronic sounds of, of this taking place. Marclay, in turn, also follows previous references in art. One of the strongest of these uh, is, is, is this work um, by a Korean-American artist Nam Joon Paik. Uh, who in 1961 was involved with a movement called Fluxus, and he, he, was, he, was, he was a musician, and he believed that, that, that what he could do would, would be to, to play a violin in a very different way. And one of those ways was to tie a violin to a string and walk away with it. Uh, in one very famous uh, point, he left the stage in London, walked out of the audience, got onto the subway or, or the tube in, in London, rode it for a couple of hours, came back and finished his performance. And you can kind of figure out what the violin looked like when, when he got there. Uh, and, and another piece sort of related to this is one for violin solo that was performed in Dusseldorf where he spends about five minutes raising and then crashing uh, a, a violin uh, as, as this noise-making device. Well, much of these, these ideas were, were kind of thought about by a, a German guy who lived in England named Gustav Metzger. Uh, and, and, and Metzger created what he called um, auto-destructive art, art that would destroy itself because he saw within destruction where our notions of creation come from and believed, as a person who had lived in Germany, that the destruction of what the Nazis had wrought, right, was something that had to be understood and had to be worked out creatively. Um, 
and this just gives kind of an idea. And so Metzger began to, to perform, uh, make work uh, like, like this one that's been updated today. And so what's going on is Metzger is, is actually um, spraying these vinyls that stand in for, for a canvas with hydrochloric acid so that the work itself is eating itself. The work is then auto-destructive. Uh, he created in 1966 uh, a, a venue for people who were thinking like him uh, and it was held over several days in London uh, in September 1966 called the Destruction in Art Symposium. Um, there was a performance that took place uh, then uh, actually for the fourth and fifth performances of Yoko Ono's cut piece uh, where viewers were enjoying to cut away her, her, her clothing on stage. Um, there was a very famous performance, again, kind of related to, to Nam Jun Paik, uh, by the American artist uh, Rafael Ortiz uh, called uh, Piano Destruction Concert. Uh, and this is the piano being destroyed. This is what it looks like after uh, it, it, it was destroyed. Um, and this is just a, a, a little what uh, or Ortiz said. So this notion of, of destruction uh, as, as being a creative force in the DAIS, well, Gustav Metzger had a student, and his, this guy's name was Pete Townsend. And Pete Townsend goes on to front a band that maybe you know of called The Who. And, and, and so the ideas of destruction of Townsend come from Gustav Metzger, and this is Pete Townsend destroying a Stratocaster. Uh, he originally destroyed a Rickenbacker, and, and this, that's actually a, a, a Gibson Les Paul. But this became then a trend. A trend that, that people referred back to. Uh, it happened in, in this movie, Blow Up. Uh, Blow Up is kind of like the, the movie that, that, that's what swinging London was like. Uh, and they asked the Who to do it, to destroy their instruments on stage, but they wouldn't do it uh, they, for, for legal purposes or whatever. And instead, um, uh, Antonioni. Uh, had to hire a new band, it was called the Yardbirds, and so there's one scene in this movie of Swinging London, 1966, where they destroy their instruments at the end of their set. Well, there was an American guy from Seattle uh, who had been a, a, a rhythm and blues player who had just moved to London uh, with uh, a, a couple of other people, Noel Redding, and they invented what they called the experience. And maybe you have heard of Jimi Hendrix before, but so here's the thing that, can ha that happened. I can't put Hendrix exactly in the Destruction in Art Symposium, but he was in London in September of 1966. It would only made sense that he would have been there. It would only made sense that he would have seen as important a band as, as The Who, because the very next thing that happens, as again, you also might know, uh, is that on June 4th, the following year, he first destroys in London a Fender Stratocaster uh, and, and even writes on it, uh, my darling guitar, please rest in peace, amen, Jimi Hendrix. And then he goes home and plays in the Monterey Pop Festival uh, a month later uh, and for the first time uh, does a version of The Wild Thing where he douses his Stratocaster again with lighter fluid, sets it on fire, uh, and this becomes a trend. The Sex Pistols do it in San Antonio. Now this is, this is really in interesting. Uh, they didn't mean to do it. Uh, the Sex Pistols come, they play in Texas, uh, and Sid Vicious gets heckled because it's like a, a country bar and people start throwing uh, bottles of beer at, at, at the British punkers, and Vicious takes off his Fender guitar and smashes a guy in the front row over the head with it. Well, that smashing of guitars became a trend. The Clash do it with London Calling, a great, great album uh, as Paul Simon smashing uh, a, a Fender bass. But notice the cover design. It, too, doesn't come from no place. It actually comes from the original album of Elvis Presley uh, that you see here, the first uh, rock album to, to make a million copies. Uh, that's exactly how many I need. Because it brings us back to Christian Marclay. So Mark Clay knows all of these references, right? He knows the art references, he knows the music references, he knows the importance of 
a Fender Stratocaster. Why did then he tie one behind his truck and drive for three miles or so near San Antonio where the Sex Pistols had played until that guitar was destroyed? In June 1998 in Jasper, Texas, this man, James Byrd, was met by three crazy white racists coming out of a convenience store. They beat him up, threw him in their pickup truck, and then tied a chain around his ankles and drove along a road until finally, as he was still alive, his body hit a culvert that decapitated him. Now, the good part of the story that I can tell you is that one of those three guys has already been executed. One is on Texas death row, uh, and one will do life in prison. In response to this unbelievable, heinous, racist hatred, there was signed into law the Hate Crimes Prevention of Act uh, by President Barack Obama as recently, however, as 2008. So the point of the work, as Mark Lay drives the Stratocaster, is really a reminder of Mr. Bird being murdered and the work ends when the guitar hits a bridge and it too is destroyed. Thanks.